Jason, and thanks, Joanne. Joanne, we really appreciate the behind the scenes look at how your team has been navigating this unique year. And uh, I trust you'll be taking some time off in the coming weeks. So great job. Um, next up, we have a discussion that, that I've really been looking forward to. Uh, and special thanks again to our partner, YouTube, for their support and for helping make this next session possible. And here to quarterback that conversation is Adweek International Editor, David Greiner. So David, congrats on that well-deserved new title and welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, we've got a really fantastic conversation. So we're gonna jump into it because we've got so much to cover in a uh, small amount of time. So very, very excited to welcome Sadie and Mike, uh, Sadie from uh, from Google and YouTube, Mike uh, from Hershey and Reese's. And uh, let, let's get them, on, get them on the stage and then we'll have uh, Sadie and Mike talk us through a little bit about their role. Welcome, uh, it's so great to have you on our stage. Hi, uh, thanks for having us. Absolutely, thanks so much for being a great partner for this event. Uh, Sadie, real quick though, like I said, we got a lot to cover today, but uh, tell us a little bit about your job because it is fascinating. I am, um, I love my job, I will say number one. I'm a director, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at Google, and I get to lead our creative partnerships for the US, which essentially means that we partner with the biggest uh, clients and brands and agencies and tell them how uh, we see creative working on Google and YouTube platforms and what we can do to continually make the work stronger and more effective to drive brand and business results. So it's a lot of fun. And it is, and uh, and sadly, Mike really has the roughest job. I mean, he's got to sell something. No one is ever looking to buy, a, a, you know, even though every time I'm at the grocery store, I basically just run my arm down the Reese's aisle and put it all in the cart. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about what you do at Hershey. Yeah, well, you know, somebody's got to do it. Um, no, I, I have the privilege of working on some of the most iconic brands in, in the world. Um, you know, my current role, uh, really approaching, you know, how we can advance things from a, a, a media standpoint and, and an integrated media position. Um, so it's, it's been fun, uh, five year ride at Hershey so far and, and really excited to see where we're going to go next. Well, obviously we're here today to talk about the big game. Uh, and uh, Sadie, YouTube has become such a core part of the Super Bowl experience, uh, it, especially when it comes to ads, when it comes to the brand integrations, but also increasingly so for athletes, for teams. Uh, first, kind of give us a, a, a quick overview, although I'm sure it's a hard thing to summarize, but how have you seen sports on YouTube evolve over this past year? Yeah, well, uh, last this past year has obviously been um, very unique in a variety of ways. Unprecedented is the word that we hear over and over again. Um, and for sports, no different. Very unique year for sports with, you know, seasons getting delayed or shortened or, um, you know, events canceled. And um, so as that took place, though, what we saw was unprecedented um, acceleration on YouTube around sports content. And that's because, you know, just because seasons may look different or sports may look different um, over the past year, you know, sports fans don't stop being sports fans. So they're continuing to dive into the content that they love. And YouTube was actually ranked the number one platform by sports fans and number one destination for highlights. People are coming for highlights, for nostalgic games, nostalgic plays, to dive into content that is about the athletes that they love. So, you know, we saw a lot of great engagement over the past year in particular, and it continues to accelerate. I think one of my favorite trends across marketing, sports marketing, uh, definitely, is the way that athletes, we used to, like uh, advertising in the in the 90s was all about deifying, like putting them on these pedestals. These were Olympian gods, right? And then I feel like now we have such a more kind of warm and direct connection. I think social media has been such a big part of that. YouTube's been such a big part of that. Tell us about how athletes and sports teams are getting more involved in the video content versus just, you know, the game footage. Yeah, well, it's definitely become more personal. There's no question about it. And there's almost an expectation by fans and by all of us that we can really understand and get to know athletes off the field and get to know them on a more personal level. And actually, 70% of sports fans for top players follow at least one athlete a few times a month while they're in season. So people are tuning in, they want to understand, they want to learn more. And we're seeing, you know, uh, some players even, you know, on, opening up their own channels on YouTube and telling their stories. So 
For example, Indianapolis Colts wide receiver Michael Pittman Jr. has a channel with his wife. Um, and he, oh, here's a clip you can see he's on his skateboard um, he heading off to practice. And we followed his journey from USC to the NFL. And over the past two years, he now has 350,000 subscribers, 20 million channel views, and that continues to rise. And by the way, he's not just talking about football. He announced that him and his wife are having a baby soon. Um, so you really get into the kind of ordinary day to day of what life is like to be an athlete. And then uh, the extraordinary part of that, too, where you're um, under some high pressure situations as well. So that is expected. And, um, you know, everyone loves behind the scenes and loves the story that's sort of behind the facade. So um, people are diving deep there for sure. Now, before we get to Mike to really talk about the brand perspective, tell us a bit about how YouTube has uh, integrated with Super Bowl uh, traditionally uh, and then how that's evolved. Uh, obviously, it is kind of the destination other than Advic, of course, for average, for the ads from the game. Uh, but tell us how that's evolved and, and how it's become kind of a multi-screen experience, too. Yeah, well, um, to answer, I guess, that last point, definitely has become a multi-screen experience. Um, I'll answer that first, and then I'll answer the other part. You know, obviously, people are watching on mobile, for sure. Mobile numbers have been heavy on YouTube for a while now, and people are watching wherever they want. So that definitely continues to rise. But what we're seeing accelerate even further is watching YouTube in the living room. So connected TV, streaming, um, big acceleration there. Actually, we've seen a 65% increase in YouTube watch time on TV screens of sports videos, and that's excluding live events. So it's definitely, um, you know, coming up on the bigger screen now. And it's not a passive thing where you just sort of have the game on in the background. People are actively seeking out the content on YouTube and searching it out and sharing it with others, obviously, if it's on a screen that others can see um, in your living room. So um, interesting to see some of those viewership dynamics continue to accelerate. And then for us at YouTube, we have youtube.com slash ad blitz. And that is our destination for all Super Bowl ads and teasers um, and extended cuts. So you can see uh, here, actually, we already have tons of ads and teasers posted because as I'm sure you've been talking about through the summit, you know, it's sort of the norm has become to post the work before the actual big game. There's gonna be a few reveals, of course, in the game itself, but there's a lot of work that's already out there. And everything we put everything up on AdBlitz so you can watch it again and again. Or if you're watching the game and it comes on and you're going to get nachos or Hershey's or Reese's or whatever we've mentioned before, you can go back and check it out on YouTube and watch it um, if you missed it during the actual game itself. So we got a lot of great stuff there and it's organized by genre. And you, know, you can share and, and talk about it there. Well, wonderful segue to snacks uh, because we definitely <laughs> want to talk to Mike here. Uh, Mike, tell us about the, and, and, and I'll encourage, by the way, our uh, everyone watching to uh, send in your questions. We're going to have a little time for Q&A, so make sure you make use of the Q&A box. Uh, but to leave room for that, uh, we'll keep moving. Mike, uh, tell us about the, you know, I know that it varies in terms of how brands use YouTube and other channels, uh, depending on whether they're in the game or not, uh, it, running a big ad. But tell us, you've, you've been on both sides of that. How, how would you describe kind of the, the best ways that brands are using it from, from your perspective? I think, you know, our, I can speak to our strategy, and it's really evolved over the, the past few years in almost every way imaginable. You know, for us, it's, it's, it's hit everything from how we create content based on brand objectives and what's working best on the platform to how we're measuring and optimizing our ad mix and creative rotation. And more and more of that's including, you know, not just sticking your ad anywhere. Uh, but first and foremost for us, it always, you know, our, our approach begins with the consumer in mind. So we dedicate a lot of resources at Hershey on understanding, you know, what our consumers are doing, how they're behaving, how that changes with time. And, and on YouTube, we work closely with them to kind of translate those insights into who we're targeting from an audience standpoint. So once you have that, and then you get the creative right, you know, what we're seeing a lot of success. Um, this past year, you know, we were seeing it too in terms of personalizing content in the gaming community on YouTube. That's that's really doing well for us. So, what can you tell us about this year's strategy? Uh, I, I don't uh, I don't believe you have an ad in the game itself, but uh, tell us about how how you're still making use of the platform. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, we don't have a, a game this year. Uh, or, or not a TV ad in the game this year like we did last year, but we're taking what we learned from last year and really applying it to make sure we're capturing those incremental eyeballs that are coming to the platform to watch the Super Bowl content and the commercials. Um, you know, what we learned from last year uh, really helped inform like what ads, what ad units, those types work best for us. So we're combining that with some of the sports affinity targeting YouTube as available to make sure we're showing up to those audiences at scale this year. And Sadie, we're going to get to some takeaways at the end of the presentation here, but uh, give us kind of the, when when a, a brand marketer comes to you and says, what's the one thing I need to know about uh, making use of YouTube, making the most of it? What do you tell them? What's the number one takeaway? Well, gosh, to narrow it down to one, I mean, I think the key thing is maybe that I'll mention is connection. You know, people come to YouTube to connect, to connect, as I said, with nostalgic content, maybe for sports, with other people. If there's a big trend on YouTube called the with me trend. So you can study with me, you know, travel with me. Um, there's all these ways to connect and people are seeking that connection. And honestly, now more than ever, especially this past year when, um, you know, we've all felt a little bit lonely and isolated to a certain extent. So, you know, that connection is really important. And so what we talk to brands about is, and similar to what Mike just said, you know, what are you understanding about your audience? What are the insights that you can garner from what they care about, what type of connection they're seeking, what they're looking for, and how can you show up in an in a authentic way to help them achieve that? And so, you know, it really is about an insight and about understanding what's the right content that will connect um, truly to those needs or those um, opportunities and, and, and to do it in a way that we know is going to also help drive results for the brand and business. Um, so, you know, that is really, I think, at the heart of it all is understand the connection. And YouTube is a platform, obviously, where there is a lot of trends. There is a lot of, we sometimes call it a culture hub in a lot of ways, because as things happen, you know, there's a lot of conversation, there's a lot of content and activity on YouTube. So as a brand, how are you connecting and understanding those trends, understanding those opportunities and showing up? Mike, uh, the w one of the things that always kind of cracks me up, although I get it, is that some brands, you know, that they'll put their newest ad on YouTube, they'll turn off comments, they'll basically put it up there and be like, all right, good to go. We've done our part. That's our strategy. I And I feel like even going beyond just putting your ad out there, there's so much room for brands to Sadie's point to really focus on engagement to going beyond to targeting as you mentioned before tell us a bit about how you've seen brands from the inside and out uh really kind of evolve their approach to using youtube well, i think you just hit it on the head that's not a cookie cutter approach from an advertising standpoint anymore uh the brands that aren't taking time to kind of evolve their their, their content and audience strategy to resonate with their you know the consumers and buyers of today they're going to get left behind and it's not easy. It's, it's heavy work. It requires like a lot of resources that, you know, five, 10 years ago from a creative and media standpoint, just weren't in house. So I think that the, the companies that, that, um, you know, want to succeed in the future, will start looking at bringing those, those, uh, type of capabilities in house. And, 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 and this is a certain talent pool that's out there that I think is finite, um, to draw from. So, you know, not everybody's uh, an award-winning creative, um, but having those folks on your team really will make the difference. I think it's you know having those folks that can predict consumer behavior, viewing trends, uh, that's going to create the future of advertising that no one really knows they want yet. So you talk about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, if I could add to that, um, if it's okay, I would just say agree with all of that. And there's also just an opportunity to learn from what you do. So as you know, because there maybe isn't one playbook um, and the playbook is evolving, then how do you continue to try uh, new approaches or understand which audiences are responding to which messages or which creative is working harder for you against the goals? So there's just an opportunity to continually, um, you know, drive creative experimentation and learning and continue to enhance the approach, enhance the plan, um, enhance the results. Sadie, we've talked about uh, a few of the big changes uh, in terms of the screen trends. We've talked about some of the classic uh, kind of aspects of YouTube with Super Bowl like ad blitz. Tell us some of the, the ways, wh whether new or maybe just underappreciated, that YouTube is kind of interwoven into the conversation and into the, the bigger public discussions around the Super Bowl in the lead up and the day up. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's similar to what I mentioned earlier in terms of the fact that, you know, um, there is so much, there's teasers, there's so many ads that come up beforehand. So there's almost this rolling thunder that happens in terms of viewership of con of the ads or of sports content even leading up to the game. So, um, you know, it's not it's no longer a moment in time that people are coming to engage with this type of content and so what we're seeing is that there's a lot of activity around sports leading up to the game um, and a lot of activity around super bowl leading up to the game a lot of searching a lot of looking at nostalgic um games or well, looking at back at tom brady or what did patrick mahomes do last super bowl um you know lots of activity and the content um continues to create that kind of momentum leading up to the game and then a lot afterward too so for example on ad blitz you know we obviously the game is this Sunday. We continue to look at all the ads and the activity around them till February 15th. And then on February 15th, we kind of declare the top, you know, the top ads, like who dominated in terms of the best of the best this year. Um, and the grand prize is bragging rights. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of activity. I think that honestly goes for any moments or any categories where, it's just we're, we're seeing on YouTube, it's not necessarily just one moment in time anymore. There's just an ongoing dialogue that happens before, during and after. And so, again, for marketers, how do you show up? Where do you go? How do you understand, um, you know, where and how to preempt or predict what may happen next um, and enter in authentically? All right. I'm going to ask you both to make this is the hardest request I can make of anyone these days is to make a prediction because none of us could have seen this past year coming anyway. But uh, based on what we've seen, based on where you uh, feel things are headed, uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Where do you see kind of what trends do you see in live sports? Do you have any predictions on how this past year might have permanently changed the way that we watch sports, consume them, or discuss them? Yeah, first, I thought you were going to ask me what I thought the spread was. But, uh, you know, I think that the other question is more relevant. Um, I think just because, you know, myself included, having so much more time at home and more time to just take in content, I think is only going to accelerate the trends we're already seeing around folks being really interested in not just the on the field in game, you know, sports, but the, the life, the behind the scenes, the coaching sessions, all the stuff that you can't watch, you know, after the, the, the game ends. That I think is just continuing to explode. And, you know, I have two young boys at home right now. I'm seeing it firsthand where the, when they're on YouTube, that's the stuff they're after. And so are their friends. So yeah, that, you know, the brands that get that right in these next two or three years, will I think be the ones that rise to the top. Uh, Sadie, what about you? What are you going to see either on YouTube or larger? Well, uh, you know, last year, the number of hours of sports related videos uploaded to YouTube in the U S grew over 40% year over year. So, Prediction is that will continue to accelerate. There's going to be more and more sports related content um, that's posted. And again, more personal, as Mike said, that's what we're seeing is people want to understand and want to connect in new ways. So, you know, beyond the beyond the highlights where you can obviously check those that are going a little deeper on some of the analysis, um, getting to know the players, getting to know their stories, um, understanding more of the back, um, you know, the back story between um, the teams or the history of the teams, there's a lot of opportunity there. So we just predict that that, that increased personal connection um, continues to rise. And just with the rise, as I mentioned, of connected TV and the living room behavior, um, more of that being shared, you know, a shared experience. And as a brand, you know, if you know that there, people are seeking connection, see, people are seeking more personal understanding, people are watching and sharing, they're leaned in, how do you show up? And how do you continue to, to write your playbook forward? All right. Well, we've talked about uh, the importance of engaging your audience. So let's do that. And let's take Q&A from our audience. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions. Uh, so I'm just going to go back and reward the people who got them in first. Uh, first question came in from Katie, who asks, what do you see as the pros and cons of not releasing a Super Bowl, uh, see, releasing your Super Bowl content on platforms like YouTube until after they air in the big game? Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? This is the number one question I get asked every single year is why do brands release them early? Yeah. Uh, what are the pros and cons? What do you I, think? I, 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 the biggest pro I see in doing that is, you know, you spend so much time and money creating one of those, those ads. And if you're only going to run it in the game one time, you know, you're going to get a frequency of one with people. 
and for us and what I'm selling, that's not what moves the category, sells our products. It's about, you know, more frequency to kind of create that top of mind awareness. So it's a mistake in my eyes to, to, you know, put something together all the time and resource and just air it one time. You know, I feel like getting it out there a week ahead of time, letting it run, you know, a couple of weeks after that's, that's how you kind of get the most out of it. Katie, what do you think? Couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just, it, it's, we're not in our, our mindset is no longer about that appointment viewing as, as much. And we want and seek, um, you know, information or ads or whatever maybe when we want it and so i think when you can create as a brand when you can start that conversation earlier and and if you really don't want to release the ad um which again mo a lot most advertisers are starting to do that ahead of time but if you really don't want to just ensuring that you've got those teasers going because you want to get into the conversation you know people are talking about the super bowl and this year uh, is a very different year people are going to be more so home in small groups and or just their family and so it's an exciting time that, you know, people like to socialize and talk about why not get that conversation going before so that when you see it in the game, you already have that understanding. You can have the conversation even further during the game and or after the game because you have that familiarity um, walking in. Oh, got a question for Mindy. And this is I'm fascinated by this, too, because I, I watched in real time as YouTube has, has uh, adapted around this is, is she asks uh, any evolution in the way that YouTube times ads within videos to lessen distraction from the user experience. Obviously, that's something YouTube's gotten a lot better about in, in over the years. Um, but what can you tell us about that process of how YouTube continues to find this balance between integrating advertising without creating distraction? Do you mean, is the question meaning like how, like the ad unit, the length of our ad units, is that? Yeah, and, and how they're served up, I assume. I know with some content, it can, it can be jarring sometimes when an ad is dropped in when you're watching some long form content. What can you tell us about kind of the behind the scenes process of, of how YouTube continues to address that? Yeah, I mean, the key is for us is that we want to, first of all, try to show ads that are relevant to what someone's watching. So again, to the point about showing up in the conversation where it makes sense as a brand. You know, if you've got a message or some sort of connection to an audience that is interested in sports and then you want to show up as a relevant ad related to that content so that it doesn't feel disruptive, it doesn't feel like it's a jarring experience in any way. You know, we have a six second ad unit that we introduced years ago, which was primarily just to keep it short and sweet. You know, you see the message, you understand it, and then you get on to the, you know, the content afterward. We also have skippable ad units, as many people are probably familiar with. Um, so that way, if you want to watch something, you can watch it. If you don't, you skip it. And that's how, and that's how it should be in terms of, you know, wanting to really um, dive in more on content that you're really interested in. And so what we're now having some fun with on the creative side is um, sequencing. If someone watches your ad and doesn't skip, what do you show them next? If someone skips your ad, what do you show them next? Or do you not show them anything next? And that's a really interesting creative um, territory that a lot of brands are playing with now, knowing that if someone leans in, what could you do to further the conversation with someone who is interested and wants to see more from you? Mike, uh, we're going to give you the last uh, public question here. Then we're going to get to the takeaways uh, for the end of the session. But uh, Jackie Brown asks about uh, your comment on bringing more talent in-house, on creative work in-house. Uh, wants to know more about the kinds of positions that you're adding. Uh, tell us a bit about how uh, the, the brand and, the, and, the, and Hershey as a company have been trying to grow that in-house talent. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's about, you know, totally replacing, like, creative agency AORs and media AORs, that, that's not it. I think it's more of complementing those those uh, big agencies with in-house uh, talent that, that's on level uh, because they don't always have the insights into the business performance and the sales metrics that we do that can inform some of the pivots I think we could be making. Um, so yeah, so, you know, some of the, the new positions we have are things you will see at traditional uh, media and creative agents. He's like, you know, art director, uh, media programmatic and data scientist even um, and everything in between. So, um, you know, I, I see the, the companies that are doing that being the ones that are showing up with better creative, quite frankly. Great. Well, thank you so much to our audience. We had so many great questions uh, and wish we could uh, make time for a bunch more. But uh, Sadie, talk, let's take a look at some of the takeaways uh, that we've talked about. And if you can uh, walk us through these three points here. Sure. Um, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but really the point that 
sports content is getting more and more personal. So if, if we understand and acknowledge that, how do we show up as marketers and or how do we bring that? You know, how do we bring that to our audience and help them dive in and see a different level? Um, because then if you think about it, then it goes beyond the season. You know, it really starts to become more of an ongoing conversation and get to know someone on and off the field, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, mentioned this as well. The viewing experience is obviously evolving beyond linear TV. We're seeing that in the numbers. Um, there's a lot of momentum with connected TV and those numbers accelerated in a big way last year and continue to move um, upward. And then, um, you know, just because we know this, view, viewer habits, you know, they're diving into YouTube, they're diving to the platform to go deep, to explore their passions, to connect. So as a brand, you know, you can show up in interesting ways, whether that is, um, you know, adjacent to that content and or in partnership with it. And you can think about, you know, partnerships. And I know Hershey's has done this with creators, you know, or with others that um, are on the platform and have, you know, massive followings. So how do you think about, ways to show up knowing that viewers are seeking the information they're leaning in um, and they're willing to go deep. Um, so there's a great opportunity there for sure. Sadie, Mike, thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic conversation uh, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thanks, David. Thanks for having us. Yeah.